We are going to go ahead and get started. Welcome, everyone. I wanted to welcome everyone to the webinar tonight. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Dr. Lauren Levine. I am your host. I'm the moderator for the webinar. We had an excellent registration uh, for this webinar, uh, close to 1,000 people. So as always, uh, first and foremost, I said for every webinar, hope that you're all staying healthy and safe out there. I commend you all for being here tonight, continuing your dental education. I know that, uh, you know, it's been a topsy-turvy year for, for a number of, of offices, but uh, we seem to be uh, where we need to be and uh, hopefully uh, on the road to uh, recovery. I'm only going to speak for a couple of minutes. I want to make sure that Dr. Kaczynski can speak for as long as he needs. We want to leave time at, at the end for questions. Most of you have been on webinars in the past, so you kind of know how the process works is that our speaker will usually talk for 45 to 60 minutes, somewhere in that range. We then open it up for questions. We, we can't do verbal questions, obviously, with 1,000 people. So type in your questions on your GoToWebinar control panel as you think about them. I try to get to as many as we can. We don't always get to every question. I see the questions that come in, so a lot of times I can combine them or figure out what the main themes are. I apologize ahead of time if we just run out of time. We typically end by half past if we still have questions that are, that are left. So um, a few other things. In the next few days, look for a link where you can uh, download and, and watch the recording of the webinar. We do record all the webinars, so don't worry if you can't make it to the end or you get distracted, uh, but we're definitely gonna make sure that you have the, the full recording. During the webinar, uh, Dr. Kaczynski is going to be showing some uh, systems and products that he uses, which are exclusive to Golden Dental. Um, I want to thank them, as always, for sponsoring these webinars. I've worked with them for many, many years. They're the ones that bring in these great speakers. They're the ones that you know develop the great content. Um, and they're also the ones that handle the CE. And, and I'm going to try to mention the CE at least a few times this evening because I get so many questions afterwards about it. Basic rule of thumb is if you're here now and you're here at the end and you stayed the whole time, obviously, you get a CE form. There's nothing you need to do. There's no quiz or registration or test or anything like that. I send the list to, to Golden Dent. They go through it. They make sure that you're on for, I, I, I don't know what the exact number of time, amount of time you have to be on. It's at least 80 or 85% of the webinar. We, we occasionally get some people who will show up 40 minutes late and then can't understand why they didn't get the CE, but it doesn't work like that. We're, we're not allowed to give out CE unless you're here for the, for the bulk of it. So that CE form uh, will go out. That usually takes about a week or so. Obviously, when we have this many people on, uh, it can take a little bit of time. So, so please be patient with that. So with that out of the way, I wanted to welcome back uh, Dr. Tim Kosinski. He's uh, spoken many times uh, on these webinars in the past. He got his DDS from the University of Detroit Mercy Dental School. He got a mastership in biochemistry from Wayne State University School of Medicine. He's a diplomat of the American Board of Oral Implantology and Implant Dentistry, uh, the ICOI, the American Society of Osteointegration. He's a fellow of the American Academy of Implant Dentistry. He got his mastership in the Academy of General Dentistry. He's also an affiliated adjunct clinical professor at the University of Detroit uh, Mercy School of Dentistry. He's on the editorial review board of Reality, which is most of you know of Reality. It's the, the source for aesthetic dentistry. And he's the past editor of the Michigan Academy of General Dentistry. He's currently the associate editor of the AGD Journals. He was named editor of Implants Today, uh, which is the implant publication for dentistry today. He's also a past president of the Michigan Academy of General Dentistry. That's his. That's the short bio. If I read the whole bio, <laughs> we would be here for the whole time. But uh, hopefully, Tim doesn't mind. Uh, Tim, we're thrilled to have you back here, and looking forward to this nice presentation. Well, th thank you, Lauren. You always make me giggle. <laughs> that's the plan. Okay, good, good. So, are we ready to go, everybody? Let's do it. Okay. Thank, thanks, Lauren. I appreciate it. Well, welcome everybody tonight on a chilly night here in, in a Detroit area. Um, I don't know how you feel uh, and where you are, but it gets dark so early. Um, well, today's topic uh, seems to be a, a very popular topic, and we're going to talk specifically about uh, suturing and membranes uh, to help you become successful in your practice. As, as you know, and as Lauren mentioned, um, we do a lot of dental implants. Um, 
here in, in Michigan. Um, I have a private practice, and, and as Lauren said, I am involved with our University of Detroit Dental School. Um, the website that I'm listing here, uh, drkaczynski.com, is simply my education website. Um, and so it definitely has a lot of information um, that you will see here tonight or is a good reference, my publications and a lot of videos. Uh, we have a lot of videos on YouTube. Uh, if you just type in my name, um, Timothy Kaczynski DDS, um, there's probably over 200 YouTube videos that will help you uh, become efficient in your practice. And it's just a view of a beautiful uh, Northern Michigan uh, on Lake Michigan, which is a, a beautiful part of the com uh, beautiful part of the country. So um, you know, we were asked from from Golden Dent um, to to put this uh, this this webinar together. And I'm always honored to be able to share some of our knowledge. We we kind of change things around. Uh, we're going to try to do quite a few videos uh, today, and hopefully they're, they're they will work fine for all of you uh, in attendance today. Um, but what we want to accomplish today is, is we want to show some predictable suturing techniques um, that will allow you to, to deliver predictable healing uh, if the protocols that we, fought, we uh, uh, discuss are followed. Um, suturing is a very, very important part of, of what we do in implant dentistry and bone grafting. Um, you, you've heard me, and many of you heard me talk about atraumatic extractions before, and I know I've been criticized for that term uh, in the past. Um, we can call it minimally traumatic, but for the sake of argument, we're trying to, to minimize the discomfort that the patients have in a very um, uh, intrusive procedure to them. You know, taking a tooth out has, has never been an easy thing for, for the public. And it's not an easy thing for us too, as, as general practitioners. I, I like to say in my lectures that I see so many broken root tips left in the jaw and it's very frustrating to be able to put implants there. But the most important thing in, in taking teeth out is we're trying to, to prevent or minimize bone loss. And we do that through our grafting procedures. And we're gonna demonstrate some of the materials that Golden Dent provides at a very, very uh, high quality, uh, and a very reasonable price that will make you um, uh, very, very competent, confident uh, in, in your grafting procedures. Um, creating reflections or flap designs are, are important. We'll discuss some of the designs that, that I, I promote. Uh, we call those envelope reflections. We try not to make vertical incisions into mucosa. I think most of us were trained that way to, to make a um, a uh, dishwasher door, so to speak. And that creates its own complications in, in scarring and uh, bringing the reflection back into its normal position. So taking teeth out is very important. Uh, filling the socket to minimize uh, bone loss in preparation for future dental implants and or our conventional prosthetic designs. And suturing of this area is critical. So we'll, we'll briefly talk about different types of sutures I use and needles, and we'll talk about different types of knots that we can, um, that we can use that prove effective and cost save, uh, time saving uh, in our practices. So we'll, again, we're gonna talk about extractions, grafting, uh, suturing in preparation for dental implants. And, and this is very important, um, this slide, uh, d demonstrates the placement of an implant. This is not an implant training course, um, obviously, um, although Golden Dent has some, some wonderful um, um, advanced um, uh, implant training programs that you may want to, to look into uh, in the future. But when we place an implant in, basically we're, we're taking a, a drill, a small drill, uh, widening it to a proper length and then threading an implant into position. We have to close this site um, after we're able to, to evaluate and, and actually see the placement of the implant. And you can see in the upper right screen, my reflection. Uh, it is a facial reflection that allows me to clearly see the facial plate of bone. My problems in my practice over 37 years, uh, my failures with the implants is because we place the implants too far facial. And, and there's certain rules that must be followed and that includes having at least a millimeter or two of facial plate of bone. 
you can see my reflection there is is rather um, minimal. Um, we did not make any vertical incisions. Rather, I um, uh, elevated the the tissue about halfway uh, through the adjacent teeth. But it certainly allows me good visualization of the available hard tissue. The implant is placed, and we are going to suture that tissue exactly where it was before, not damaging or pulling or tugging. And this happens to be a, a continuous mattress suture that we will demonstrate um, a little bit later. So you can see how clean, firm, protected that implant site is. We maintain a band of attached gingiva, and Lauren being a periodontist, you know how important that is to, to maintain a band of attached gingiva on the facial aspect of all our implants. Um, again, another situation where we've, we've placed an implant, and in your implant training, uh, or if you're developing implant training, we, we realize that if we're able to get a certain amount of torque in any implant system, we can do one stage surgical procedures, which means we can put a, what we call a healing abutment, which is simply a longer screw that penetrates through the soft tissue that allows for proper healing without the need for uncovering the implant after integration, which means no anesthetic. I like to tell my patients when we're able to do this, I congratulate them and say, hey, congratulations, um, your bone was so good today that we're able to do two surgeries in one. And they normally say, what? And I'll say, well, you know, we don't have to numb you next time around when we're ready to take the impression in the final crowns. So in this, this view, and we're gonna go through these in great detail, we're actually able to place a healing abutment or a taller screw that penetrates through the soft tissue. And again, because my reflection is um, very non-invasive, we made no vertical incisions, I am able to simply tie two interrupted uh, knots or two interrupted sutures in place and uh, reposition that reflection exactly where it was before, allowing for very good, healthy healing. So what type of sutures do I use in my practice? Well, mostly I will use PGA or polyglycolic acid, which is a synthetic suture. It's uh, very high quality, provided by Golden Dent. Uh, it's absorbable braided and it resorbs in about 28 days or so. Um, what I like about this, this material, it does not accumulate plaque and it resorbs to water. Um, so it's a very, very kind, um, very kind suture to the surgical areas that I'm working in. Another type of suture we, we probably use in dental school is silk. Um, I don't use a lot of silk in my practice. Uh, it is non-resorbable, but it has a tendency to, to attract plaque and bacteria. And these sutures definitely have to be removed in a relatively short amount of time. Now, in my practice, I like to see all my surgical patients in seven to 10 days. I'd like to remove their sutures um, and evaluate my surgical site so that I have better control. Everybody's going to heal at a different rate, obviously, depending on their health condition. And another reason I like to, to remove the sutures, and, and may, many of you have probably had the same experience, is our patients tend to do very, very well with the surgical procedures, as long as you're not making uh, vertical incisions into mucosa. Once we incise in the mucosa, we get histamine and prostaglandin release, and the patients do experience discomfort. If we're able to, to not incise into mucosal tissue, most of my patients do very well. But the tissue still has to heal. And oftentimes a patient will, will do very well for the first three, four days, call the office and say, something's wrong. Um, I was doing great and it's starting to irritate me. And that's because the tissue wants to, to close and the sutures don't allow it. So um, be, just be aware of that. Um, that's my protocol in my practice. Um, obviously, if a patient is leaving town or is unable to come back in seven to 10 days uh, using a resorbable material, uh, we know that over a period of time that those sutures will fall out by themselves. Plain gut and chromic gut are very popular. They're relatively inexpensive sutures compared to uh, the PGA uh, sutures that I use. Uh, but then that it just becomes a handling situation. It's what you feel most comfortable using uh, in your hands.
but I'd like to make sure my knots are firm and that they don't come out and so that we get proper tissue healing. In dentistry, all our needles are reverse cutting, which eliminates the tension upon closure. Um, and I'm gonna show you my suturing technique that may be different than what you were trained to do um, um, in dental school. Sizes of our, of our uh, threads in dentistry are 3.0 to 6.0. Um, I have a tendency to, to use 3.0 and 4.0. So if you are going to invest uh, in a package deal with Golden Dent today, I would say um, choose uh, some 3.0, some 4.0 thread size. And we have different uh, needle um, um, anatomy. Um, and I would recommend that you get a 3.8 circle and a 1 half circle, um, which are used in different situations, uh, which allows you good control and control allows you a better result. So you can see the anatomy of, of, the, of a needle. We have a wide diameter area, and that is specifically the area that you are going to, to place your, um, your hemostat, your needle holder, your um, uh, whatever, whatever instrument you use, um, and because it's the thickest part of the instrument. It also allows you good control in um, using this reverse cutting needle, which does not create tension in your closure. So Golden Dent provides a, a wide variety of, of sutures at a very, very reasonable cost. Um, and I'm sure um, Kurt Lawler will, will demonstrate some of the specials that they have um, for you for, for bearing with me over the next hour, hour or so. This is a great, um, suture book, um, if you want to take a quick photo of it. Um, it is schematic of the different types of, of um, suture um, techniques that I use in my practice, and it'll help you become very, very competent uh, with practice. Uh, you can schematically use this, uh, practice on an orange or a lime or a lemon or a grapefruit, and allows you uh, to really understand now, I strongly recommend that you, you don't go to Amazon or Barnes & Noble to find this book because I, I've, I've done that and they're like $1,000. Um, it's a great book, but I don't know if it's worth $1,000. If you go to Salvin Dental, S-A-L-V-I-N Dental, it's a company out of Charlotte, North Carolina, I think they sell this book for $99. And so it's definitely a, a book that is worth the, that amount. So the, the Suture book is, is a very, very nice um, adjunct uh, to the uh, to a program like today, and these are some of the schematics from that um, um, from that that book, showing a simple interrupted suture technique. And an interrupted suture is probably our our basic, uh, where we go from facial to crestal, um, and then simply go from crestal to lingual in this situation, and then bring the needle around. Um, my knotting techniques is two, two, one. I will go forward two times, which will close the tissue. I will go forward again two times. And what that allows is the, the suture to push that tissue into position. And then finally, I will go one backwards or counterclockwise to, to control that knot so that it does not come loose. So if any of you have had situations where you've done sutures and they loosen uh, much quicker than you expect or want, um, that is an excellent uh, technique. Two forward, two loops forward, tie the knot, two loops forward again, tie the knot, which is going to push that knot back into tissue, and then reverse uh, counterclockwise and tie your final knot so that it will not come loose. Another suture that I use that will demonstrate um, uh, this evening is a continuous suture where we uh, basically start with an interrupted design. Uh, we go from facial to, to lingual in this situation. And then we simply will loop that suture over and over again. So when a patient would ask me, how many sutures did you place? You really just one. So you'll go from facial to lingual, tie a knot, and then you'll go facial to lingual again, but rather than tying a knot, you'll go through the rabbit ears and that will give you a continuous loop. When you finish the suture, you'll go facial to lingual and the rabbit ears will become your tail. And again, two forward, tie the knot, 
two forward to to uh, ensure the knot, and then one backwards to lock that knot, knock it, uh, lock that knot into place. And we'll demonstrate this with some video video demonstrations. Uh, a horizontal mattress is an, a great suture. Uh, it's a periodontal suture which will um, allow you to, to create attached gingiva. We'll demonstrate that. Um, and it also gives you really fine closure uh, in a controlled uh, environment. So again, we may go facial to, to lingual or palatal in this situation, loop the suture around um, and go from palatal to facial and tie the knot and uh, on the facial aspect. And again, we'll demonstrate this with some, some videos. So very, very good uh, schematics. So let's look at an area. Again, we made a reflection without vertical incisions. We have a couple implants here. We're going to, because we're able to torque those implants to, to a certain amount, we put healing abutments. We're simply longer screws that penetrate the tissue. And here you can see I went from facial to, to palatal, but I did not engage, I did not engage the palatal tissue. Rather, I went around that healing abutment. And it's basically a, this is basically a periodontal uh, suture. And then I reverse the needle and I go from facial to palatal, again, I am not engaging, not engaging the palatal tissue whatsoever. And I'm going to loop it around that healing abutment or a tooth, if it was a tooth. And my staff will give me a little help here to kind of hold that suture line. And I wrapped it around the healing abutment. And then I will simply tie a knot on the facial aspect to forward and you can see how easily we have control of that soft tissue to place the the attached gingiva that was on the crestal aspect. Uh, of the tooth, moving it to the facial aspect of our implants. The bone is completely exposed in the crustal area, but our epithelium grows easily a half a millimeter to a millimeter a day, which will pro provide complete cl um, closure of that area in a very short amount of time. And you can see the health of the tissue that we're able to create. Here we're using a, um, uh, again, a reflection where we are not incising into attached gingiva. An implant is placed, two implants are placed. And here you can see, because we didn't make any vertical incisions, the reflection is replaced very easily. The mucogingival line is, is addressed. And here we're taking a re, the reverse cutting needle and going from facial to palatal. We have a short tail there. And we're simply doing an interrupted suture. Wrapping it around twice. Now you only pull one end of a suture. You do not pull both ends. It gives you ex excellent control. And two again, the knot is now perfectly in position. And normally I would just do one turn in the reverse area and that will keep it. I'm cutting the tail. Now this is a continuous mattress suture. So here I'm going from facial to palatal. But rather than, than doing an interrupted, I'm going through the rabbit ears and the rabbit ears will then become a second suture. And you can see this is real time how fast and efficient this suturing technique is. 
needle through, through the rabbit ears, and continuing the closure of this site. Through the rabbit ears. Nearly done. Gives me complete control, complete replacement of that reflection. Now I hear I'm closing it and I did not go through the rabbit ears and that rabbit ears now becomes my tail. And I think with practice, you can become very efficient and you can, you can see the time saving um, that you will have in your surgical procedures. Snip, we'll wipe it. Give it a good squeeze. And this is a continual mattress suture, which gives us great um, uh, closure in a very efficient amount of time. And this is one week post-operative, and you can see how quickly the tissue heals in that area. A more difficult suturing technique, here we did a, a, a full arch, and he, because we did make a vertical incision here so that I could control my midline prior to placement of the implant, I'm going to do close that vertical incision first with an interrupted suture. So you see our tail, one, two, we'll close that vertical incision which provided my midline in my surgical techniques and again these are the pga from um, golden dent high quality relatively inexpensive suture just interrupted cut both and you can see we have our primary closure i'm going to do another one real quick here Going to go a little faster, We're speeding up the, the video. Now, when I have a, a full arch like this, I'm going from facial to lingual in this situation. And I'm going to tie my knot, my interrupted knot, as we showed earlier. And we get really nice primary closure. And you can see the complete control that I have um, in this uh, reflection or this flap design. I'm going to cut the short tail here, and we're going to do another um, mattress suture. to save time. So the important thing that I wanna leave you with is that we really have really control of the soft tissue depending on what we need to do. We went through the rabbit ears. Holding the tissue and getting really nice primary closure of our entire surgical procedure. I'm hoping that everybody's video is working well here. Uh, tonight. And again, just efficient use of time and energy. The quicker we're in with these patients, the better the closure, the better the end result. I don't worry about um, exposure or tissues breaking um, with our patients. We have we have just have a nice controlled situation and circumstances in a procedure that literally takes minutes.
in, in the final closure. Now here, I did not go through the rabbit ears. The rabbit ears will become my tail. And we simply tie the knot, two going in one direction and then one going backwards and snipping. So you can see we get nice closure in that area and then we'll do the same thing on the other, other side. Good control, evaluating uh, attached gingiva in our final restoration. So, you know, attached gingiva is, is very important, and I'm going to run through this a little bit quicker. I think you get our protocol. But we have a, a, um, a edentulous area, and it's very important that we maintain attached gingiva on the facial aspect of any tooth uh, or any dental implant. Um, and so here we're making an incision, uh, we're, we're physically placing an implant. Uh, it's buried underneath the gum tissue, uh, good position. And uh, we did a continuous suture as we demonstrated two weeks postoperatively, the gums heal, the, the tissue heals, uh, attached gingiva heals amazingly. Uh, again, growing a half a millimeter to a millimeter every day. Um, patients don't experience dis much discomfort as long as you're not incising in attached gingiva. Um, we're going to here. Um, three months post-op, get ready to expose the implant. And to demonstrate that, most of us would use some type of what we call a tissue punch. And what we're doing is simply a circular blade that's removing the tissue over the top of the implant. I want you to look at this very carefully and the mistake that I'm making here that I'm demonstrating. What am I incising into? I'm incising into attached gingival. Made a mistake. This is an impression post. We put the impression coping uh, into, the, um, into the implant to take our impression, but I do not have a band of attached gingiva. So I'm gonna go ahead and fabricate that crown, but I have to fix what I did, the mistake that I made. So I'm making an incision um, on the lingual aspect of the crest. I'm going to try to harvest the attached gingiva that was on the crestal area, and I'm gonna move it over to the facial area where that implant is. So I'm making an incision. This happens to be uh, what we refer to as an Orban knife, O-R-B-A-N knife. Uh, it gives me a lot of control. It's a very sharp stainless steel blade. Uh, allows me to, to make my incisions around teeth without making vertical incisions. I'm reflecting it, almost like, like peeling an orange. So I've taken that band of attached gingiva that was on the the, the crestal area or slightly lingual to the crest, and I'm peeling it towards the facial aspect. I am not reflecting the lingual tissue whatsoever. I'm not reflecting the lingual tissue whatsoever. I'm putting a tall healing abutment in that integrated implant. I'm torquing it to position. Now, this is a little bit different. This is the, the, the um, a suture that I demonstrated earlier uh, in the schematic. I'm going from facial mesial, mesial facial with my reverse cutting needle. I am not engaging the lingual tissue whatsoever. Rather, I'm going around that healing abutment. If this was a tooth, I could go around the tooth, not engaging the lingual tissue. I'm reversing my needle and going from distal facial, again, not engaging the lingual tissue, coming around that healing abutment and tying a knot on the mesial facial, one suture. Now, by taking that attached gingiva that was on the crest and moving it to the facial aspect of the implant, I now have a significant uh, exposure of bone on that crestal area. I'm not concerned with that at all. I don't cover it, I don't glue it, I don't do anything special. I tell the patient, uh, stay away from crunchy foods like nacho chips, potato chips. They can rinse with warm saline. 
epithelium will physiologically grow a half a millimeter to a millimeter a day, and we will granulate in. Even though we have exposure of, of hard tissue in this situation, three weeks later, we now have healthy tissue with a band of attached gingiva on the facial aspect of my implant, which allows for an outstanding prognosis of the final restoration. In this situation, it was a um, uh, screw retained uh, implant crown. Certainly within your wheelhouse, certainly something that you are able to achieve uh, in your dental practices today. Now, grafting material, uh, we have uh, various grafting materials that we use. And, and I like to say in my lectures, you don't need 50 different materials. Um, I work with an allograft material from Golden Oss, uh, from Gold Oss, from um, Golden Dent. Uh, it's a high quality, um, 250 to 1,000 micron shaped um, uh, cadaver bone, um, which allows for osteoinduction and osteoinduction, uh, which helps bone replacement. Remember when we're grafting, we're not pouring concrete into a, into a site. Rather, we're going to get bone turnover over time. Osteoclast will attack this material, um, uh, which will stimulate osteoblasts to lay down and replace the viable bone. Membranes that are available through got, um, uh, from Golden Dent, uh, one of the materials is called EpiGuide. It's bioresorbable, it's a synthetic material, although we do also use um, um, uh, membranes from um, peritoneum. It's, uh, this EpiGuide in particular is three layers, maintains structural integrity. Now, whenever we're using allograft, we must protect that allograft from invagination of epithelium. We always must use a high quality membrane. That membrane must remain intact for at least six weeks. If we're able to do that, doctors, we can grow bone 100% of the time. The problem that I see is that oftentimes that membrane um, is not properly placed, it's not passively placed, or it is not uh, maintained for at least six weeks. If the membrane um, is not there for at least six weeks, the case becomes unpredictable. And some of you may have done grafting procedures understanding that, uh, but came back and we had mush. We didn't have um, viable bone. The second material I use in my practice is something called osteogen, again, available through uh, Golden Dent. It's a, a homogenous mixture of a, a calcium apatite crystals in a bovine, bovine Achilles tendon matrix. Uh, it, it combines those two. It makes socket pre preservation easy and extremely affordable. Um, and no membrane is required. The epithelium has two options um, when it's gonna go over this material. It can invaginate into the material like it would in allograft, or it could grow over the top of it. And because of the consistency of this specially made material, the epithelium is always going to follow the path of least resistance, so you don't need a membrane with this relatively inexpensive graft material. It's a graft and collagen combined. It uh, provides um, the purpose of a membrane and a socket preserver, contains the graft material, it doesn't allow connective tissue to grow through it uh, because it will always follow the path of least resistance and grow over the top. So it's a very, very cost effective, especially in sockets where you have all the walls intact. We know when we remove teeth, um, the bone's gonna shrink. It's gonna shrink down and in, in the lower jaw, up and in, in the upper jaw. Um, the area of the posterior maxilla, we know that tooth roots act like a tent pole holding up a circus tent. If you remove the tent pole, the circus tent collapses. And these are two areas that complicate implant placement for most of us. The posterior mandib mandible, we're concerned about bone loss and the proximity of the submandibular nerve or canal. And in the posterior maxilla, we're concerned with collapse of the sinus, which doesn't allow us to effectively place a, an implant uh, in viable bone. Golden Dent has a outstanding um, grafting kit, uh, relatively inexpensive, everything that you need. Doctors, if you're going to get involved with 
trauma, atraumatic extractions and grafting procedures, you must have sharp, proper tools to be able to become very efficient and proficient. And I think um, um, uh, Kurt with Gold, Golden Dent will, will discuss some of the specials, or hopefully he will today. Uh, a wide variety of, of outstanding, um, high quality um, blue titanium um, uh, material, uh, which I use in the practice. This is my favorite go-to grafting kit. Um, um, you, may, you may decide to invest in a different needle holder, but again, keeping costs down, uh, having instruments that, that are predictable, that make you efficient and proficient is important. Um, the uh, curettes are very specially designed. Um, they, they're serrated. We know that when we have a socket, we must curette, 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 granulation. Um, purple blood is bad, red blood is good, but we can't have any granulation in those sockets. And that's a question that I often have um, with, with, in my courses is how do you curette? Well, if you have proper tools, you're able to get that granulation tissue uh, easily out of the socket. It allows you a lot of control. You know, these are types of patients that I have in my, my practice uh, in the suburbs of Detroit. Um, we're, we're not in, it's not an indigent area, but uh, there are people that neglect their teeth for a number of reasons. Um, cost, fear of the dentist, maybe taking care of their family first. But at some time, um, these patients uh, decide that their health mandates um, that we do something. So extraction techniques are very important. And again, we kind of coined the term atraumatic extraction years ago. Um, there's a lot of ways to extract. I'm going to show you what I use in my practice every day. I think I did it four times today. And I can honestly tell you that I would not work without um, these instruments that I'm going to demonstrate in a second. Uh, here we have a, a, a maxillary molar, a three molar tooth that we want to remove. It's deemed non-restorable. How would most of you remove this tooth today? Well, I, I would venture to gather that most of you would remove the crown uh, with whatever technique, um, you know, taking a burr, uh, cutting it, and then sectioning the three roots, removing the palatal root, the mesiofacial, and the distal facial roots. Very time consuming. Um, in my hands, I will use what are what's referred to as the physics forcep, which is a series of instruments that allow me to, um, to remove the teeth uh, in one single uh, movement. Here I'm taking a, a periotome just to establish, to make sure that I have established anesthesia. And this is the series of instruments that I strongly recommend you use. Um, I use them just about every day. Uh, it's a series of four instruments called Physics Forcep from Golden Dent, uh, an upper right, uh, um, upper anterior, upper left, and a lower universal. Um, they have silicone bumpers, what we refer to as bumpers, which are just soft cushions uh, for the instrument. There are two components to this. There are two components to this instrument. The beak is the, uh, the working end of the instrument. That is the shovel-shaped edge, which I will engage the lingual or palatal aspect of the tooth, one to three millimeters subgingival. Now you must have a purchase point um, on that tooth. The bumper is the second um, uh, end of the instrument, is not the working end of the instrument. Rather, this part is placed as high up into the vestibule or as down low into the vestibule as possible and it is simply acting as a center of rotation or a pivot point to allow tension to be formed on the palatal aspect or lingual aspect by the beak. That tension uh, creates a physiologic reaction of the body, releasing an enzyme which will break down the periodontal ligament. What's holding your teeth in place? Periodontal ligament. If the periodontal ligament is melted away, that tooth will, will elevate up and out of the socket following the arc of rotation of this specially designed instrument. So here I engage the beak, one to three millimeters subgingival, putting the bumper as high up the vestibule as possible. And again, that bumper is not holding the facial plate, rather it is simply acting as a center of rotation, which will allow me with simple finger pressure, I am not squeezing this instrument, I am not squeezing this instrument, so it is simply a traumatic to the patient. Many of our patients are just amazed 
that were able to remove a tooth without that uh, constant stress and pain uh, associated with squeezing of an instrument using our conventional techniques. In a matter of seconds, by rotating my wrist towards the corner of the left eye in this situation, the tooth will pop. You're not gonna hear it pop, but it's going to disengage up and out of the socket. It is not intended to remove the tooth in total, rather it's intended to luxate the tooth up and out. And you can see here that I'm not putting any pressure, I'm not squeezing whatsoever um, on the instrument, rather rotating with constant pressure. Again, the instrument's not intended to remove the tooth in total. We will take what's referred to as a tooth delivery instrument, a bird beak forcep, and I'm able to simply remove this tooth, not in, in 10, 20 minutes, but rather in a minute or so. You can see the divergence of the roots, the cleanliness of the roots, and even though this, there was fractures here, now critical at this situation that we curette the socket. We cannot leave granulation in that socket. So curette, 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 curette the three sockets. Always take a radiograph following an extraction. I wanna make sure that no root tips were left in the socket site. I see that way too often, which makes my implant placement that much more challenging. Here, I'm gonna use the osteogen plug, that, that specially formulated uh, synthetic material of calcium apatite in a bovine Achilles um, tendon matrix. I can then simply cut it with a scissors to make it look like the root of the tooth that we're going to replace. I will take it to site, it will absorb blood, and I will pack it firmly into those three socket sites. Now I want this material to end up right at the crest or slightly above the crest. If you need more than one piece of material, you use that. Uh, it's important that we compress uh, firmly, not crushing, but firmly to the crest of the ridge. This is a material that is 40 or $50 as opposed to um, over $200 for an allograft and a membrane. Now my suturing techniques in this situation is a little bit different. I'm taking my reverse cutting uh, needle with my PGA material, and you can see rather than going facial to palatal, as most of us would do, I'm going from crest to facial. This allows the reverse cutting needle to slide on top of the, this graft material, or if I did have a membrane, on top of the membrane. If you suture from facial to palatal when there's a membrane in place, oftentimes we will engage that membrane. We bring the patient back in a week, you or your staff removes the suture and you pull the membrane out. The membrane isn't remaining intact for at least six weeks, the case will become unpredictable. I don't know what the results are going to be. So you saw I went from crest to facial, I, I reversed the needle and went from crest to palatal in this situation, and then tied my interrupted suture as we uh, indicated previously. I'm gonna do it again, uh, another cross link, just to hold that material in place. And finally, I'll do a third one. So you can see I do not have primary closure. Do I care? Absolutely not. I'm more concerned that we have a, a clear band of attached gingiva on the facial aspect of this uh, extraction site. Again, epithelium physiologically is going to grow a millimeter, uh, to a half a millimeter to a millimeter a day. So I would assume in a week, maybe up to two weeks, depending on the health of the patient, this area will close completely. Immediately post-operatively, we take a radiograph and you can see the material does have radiolucency to it, but in a very quick four months, we start to see a change. And I hope you can see the opacity that's occurring, in the, especially in the apical portion. Um, physiologically, this bone will heal from apex towards the crest. So I expect more maturity at the apex, apical area than I do at the crestal area in four months. So this is how the tissue heals. I'm going to reflect it for you so you can clearly see 
that we have bone. Now the bone at the crustal area showed some radiolucency. It's not as mature as the apical portion, but if I'm going to place an implant, I'm going to get my initial stability in the apical um, two millimeters anyways. I do a lot of histology, and many of you may have seen my, my publications, where we will take a core sample of that grafted site, it was a big grafted site, and we will do a histologic evaluation. And without taking a lot of your time, um, magenta, or pink in this situation, is natural bone, that's bone turnover. The violet or purple is, is the graft material that is not turned over yet. And so we are getting bone formation. And then this is again, not an implant course, we're simply going to place our implant. Most implant systems, you start with a pilot burr. Um, here we're using uh, what we call osteotomes to actually condense that, that uh, immature bone um, to make it stronger, almost like squeezing, um, um, squeezing um, material to make it more compact as a styrofoam, as opposed to cutting uh, and, and making the hole bigger. An osteotome is simply a tool that is condensing what we did. We'll run through this rather quickly. If we had any type of sinus, um, um, uh, sinus perforation, I will take a bit of that golden dent uh, uh, membrane material, cut a little uh, parachute, place it. And if we need to, we can use another uh, osteogen plug, condense it again. And here I'm threading my implant into place. And in a grafted site, after a quick four months, we're able to torque that to 40 Newton centimeters, which is incredible torque, to the crest. You can clearly see we are at the crest uh, with the height of the implant. We're going to do our closure that we showed you earlier. This is a continuous suture that we demonstrated. You can see I do not have primary closure, but epithelium is going to grow very quickly. And you know, this is an important slide. At the crestal area, you, you see it's more um, radiolucent, but we know that that implant was put towards the crest. That's just how more immature bone looks on our digital radiograph. Again, a CBCT analysis post-operatively shows the position of the implant at the crest, and we're gonna allow this implant to heal for another four months and allow it to, to, um, to integrate. So, you know, the, the golden dent uh, has a series of instruments, uh, periotomes that um, we, we use to, to uh, check for anesthesia, and also to break down the periodontal ligament. Here I'm taking my physics forcep, not squeezing the instrument, creating tension on the palatal aspect of this root, rotating my wrist towards the corner of the right eye in this situation. And here, this is real time, constant tension, creating a physiologic release of enzyme, which is breaking down the periodontal ligament, the tooth released. I'm taking a tooth delivery instrument, and removing this tooth, fairly long tooth, in a matter of seconds. Take your, your, uh, your serrated, high quality curette, remove any granulation tissue, evaluate the facial plate of bone. You must have bleeding if we're going to graft, so I'll take a round burr. And I just wanna demonstrate here I'm gonna make a little incision. I wanna show you that that facial plate indeed remained intact using the, the physics forcep. I often hear that um, uh, the facial plate will break and it's a technique. Um, uh, we do courses um, at the schools here in Detroit and you will become very proficient in the um, use of the physics forcep. Time saving, saving of bone, saving uh, trauma to the patient and saving your body. And here we're simply going to place an implant or prepare the site for an implant. Now we have a socket that is shaped like an egg. Our implants are round. So I'm going to take again an osteogen plug and simply, doctors, it can't get simpler than this, filling that socket 
with this calcium appetite in a bovine Achilles tendon matrix. And packing it. And I'm simply going to be able to thread my implant right into that graft material. That graft material will then compress against all the walls of that socket, almost like caulking, to fill the void. I'm going to use my torque wrench to torque that implant to position. In a socket site, I want to position that implant about a millimeter subcrestal. And if the patient's a smoker or you don't get primary closure, I'll take a piece of that, that osteogen material and make a manhole cover and I'll simply place it on top. This is especially true in smokers. Uh, you must protect that implant from heat, tar, nicotine. And again, I'm just packing it on top and suturing. I don't get primary closure, which, but I'm okay with that. Our implant is ideally positioned. The void is covered over with our material. So we know that if we remove teeth, bone is going to shrink, which is going to decrease the width and height of the supporting bone. Um, bone can continue to shrink, resulting in paresthesia or dis, uh, diminished aesthetics. Grafting at the time of extraction will help prevent bone loss. It will help support the soft tissue architecture, prevent periodontal pathology, and it will provide an adequate site for implants in a short a three to four months. If you don't graft, this is a, a good, good slide to take a photo of, and you're educating your patients on the importance of grafting, you, you will get soft tissue infiltration, you will get loss of ridge height and width, and the literature will say we will get 30 to 60% bone loss uh, in a very short amount of time which means that if you want to do um, um, improved aesthetics or an implant in the future, you may, may, may need a much more uh, involved surgical procedure. Uh, Lauren, I'm gonna go ahead and stop here. We're almost at the uh, top of the hour because I'm sure we have some questions, uh, which I'd be happy to, to take time to answer. We do have questions. Uh, the first thing that we're going to do, though, is turn it over to uh, Kurt from Golden Dent. Um, I had mentioned at the beginning of the webinar that these webinars, unfortunately, do not create themselves. <laughs> we depend on uh, you know uh, sponsors and, and companies to, to help put this together for us to, to bring you in, to, to bring in the content. Um, one of the things that I've always loved about working with Golden Dent is that not only are they sponsoring the webinar, they're gonna offer some specials as well as some educational opportunities. So Kurt, I'll have you take it away and then we'll open it up for questions uh, at the end. All right, Lauren, I appreciate it. My name is Kurt Lawler. I'm with Golden Dent. We're also uh, here in Detroit, like uh, Dr. Krasinski. And uh, we are uh, a company that started um, the instrument aspect and the education in, in 2007, but we have um, 80 years of uh, Detroit dental history here and in Detroit within our family. And we uh, operate on the principles of providing simple, predictable, and unconventional products that's, uh, that are different but clinically work, starting with the physics forceps, which was our first product. So I'm gonna mention this first before I uh, get into a couple other slides. Uh, I know this is uh, usually one of the more popular slides for some of the uh, dentists that join our webinars on a regular basis. We are offering a 15% off uh, coupon code this evening. Uh, the code is uh, simply uh, 15 and then uh, off. So it's a, that's a, uh, uh, letter there not a number so it's a, it's one five and then uh off is, is the code so that'll get you 15 percent off at uh, golden-dent.com on any of the the products uh, on our website so we do these deals uh we just did uh, some different offers uh recently for black friday and things like that and so we this is another great deal we do the deals kind of quickly here so this one's good for uh the next 24 hours expiring uh, tomorrow evening uh, to get that 15% off promotion. So I'm just going to mention a couple of things here uh, quickly. I know we went over a lot of this already uh, during the presentation, uh, but extractions and grafting is kind of, uh, that that's what started our business. We started with the physics forceps, and then we've expanded to, to add everything related to extractions and grafting, whether that's our PGA sutures, 
uh, the graph kit, uh, the bone graph that goes with it. And we, we really have all the products to, to take you from, I guess, A to Z related to the extraction and the graft of the, uh, the socket site. Um, I don't have time to get into that this evening here, but uh, end, the endo section is another uh, large uh, part of our product portfolio now. We do stock all the, the Woodpecker brand products, um, whether it's their Apex locator, their files, or their endo motors. Uh, if you haven't been to our website in a while, I encourage you to take a look at that. Um, we really have expanded in the, uh, the endo market. Same with restorative, uh, we have our own sectional matrix system and uh, a really popular uh, curing light, which is inexpensive. It's around around 500 bucks and it's really good, um, a wide spectrum curing light. Um, I just wanna mention these two things just before I kind of get back on topic uh, for the extractions and the grafting component. So like I said, we are your, your one-stop shop for atraumatic extractions. Um, that's that's what we started with and, and that's uh, that's our main core of our business here. So the physics forceps, uh, this was already shown in the presentation, but this is our uh, atraumatic extraction set of four instruments. Uh, this is our most popular set of physics forceps. Uh, we have one other set that does uh, erupted third molars or hard to reach second molars. Um, but for anybody that is not already using these instruments, uh, this is the set that I definitely recommend. You've got one lower instrument and then three upper instruments. And the uh, the technique was already demonstrated this evening on the webinar, um, but this is uh, this is the first product that we have for uh, atraumatic extractions. So if you want to use a uh, instrument like a periotome or an elevator or a luxator in advance uh, to start to separate the tissue or break down the PDL, obviously that's not going to hurt. We have a, a large uh, a number of options uh, for instruments to use prior to the physics forceps or even. I guess prior to a conventional uh, type extraction forcep that you're comfortable with, um, we have all those available also. So as far as um, I know, we showed the um, more of like the manual curette of the or serrated curette, uh, but sometimes if you can't manually uh, uh, curette the socket site, we have a, a really nice uh, kit, which is our uh, degranulation and shaping burr kit. So you'll see there in the top right, those are the the tissue and degranulation burrs. Uh, these are uh, these are really nice. This is a good uh, block of burrs uh, that's nice for your extraction and your grafting uh, instrumentation because then you also have your bone shaping burrs, a good cutting burr, and then most importantly the uh, the degranulation burrs. So I wanted to mention that because I don't I don't think we covered this in the the webinar this evening. And then this we did go over. That's going to be our serrated curette. This is our uh, graph kit that Dr. Krasinski helped us uh, develop and kind of pick each individual instrument, uh, keep everything in one, one cassette, uh, just use it for grafting, make sure everything's sharp. Um, this, this full kit with the cassette is around, uh, it's around $500, a, a little bit less obviously with the discount code. So osteogen plugs, the, the blue star there is the large size. That's gonna be the most popular uh, size of the plug. Uh, I know a lot of our customers that join on a regular basis are already using the osteogen plugs, but I just wanted to show uh, the five available sizes. You have your, your slim, large, and your extra large. Uh, and with that being said, the large is definitely the most popular, which can always be cut to shape too. Uh, the two on the right, those, are, those have some different applications. Those are not membranes, um, but they are... Uh, Pretty a, a flat membrane um, with some different uses, which uh, we have on various videos and things on our website, what they're used for. Uh, but the large plug is what I would look at if you have not used that product before. Uh, Allograft, I mean, obviously a lot of different companies have Allograft. Uh, we've uh, been very happy with the clinical results um, that we've seen from our customers with our Goldoss brand. Um, it's priced competitively. And uh, if you have not tried it, I encourage you just to look at our pricing and maybe compare it to what you're paying now. We've had uh, really good uh, luck with our supply and our stock and our, and our supplier. We haven't really had any issues during um, the last few, year, few years when some other companies were struggling with some supply issues. Epi guide on the left, uh, that's our long lasting uh, membrane. That's the one that uh, was demonstrated this evening and that's the one uh, I would recommend that we do do stock and uh, works for uh, pretty much pretty much every case because it's long lasting. The the coliform one shown there too is uh, also a good membrane, but the epiguide is going to be the more popular one. 
Sutures, we already went over this. Um, our PGA, we have in the 3.0 and the 4.0 uh, size. And then we also have the uh, black silk and chromic gut, if that's uh, what you prefer. Um, I don't think we mentioned this. This, this is uh, one of my last slides here. So this is a BioViva. This is a great product for uh, bleeding control, or if you're uh, maybe doing a third molar extraction or not grafting the socket site. Um, it prevents dry socket, controls bleeding. It's going to be something that's comparable to uh, gel foam, but a, just a much more affordable price. As soon as it, uh, I guess, connects or uh, uh, with the blood, it, it turns into like a gel, and it's not something that needs to be removed. Um, it can stay on the socket site. And then lastly, I'll just mention our classes. We, uh, under the Amplified Dental Training uh, name, which is our educational programs, um, we have uh, live patient extraction classes. So these are um, the ones that are more related to the topic this evening. We have uh, an atraumatic extraction class, um, an atraumatic extraction and grafting class, and then we have um, the one that's uh, actually coming up next uh, next weekend already is our uh, AMP3, which is uh, very similar to AMP1 and 2, but it's just a little bit more advanced where you actually will use a uh, like a straight nose cone and, 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 and level the bone in, in preparation for uh, immediate denture. So it's just a little bit more of an advanced class. So if you're interested in any of our classes, these are live patients. So you do all the surgeries. We provide the patients. We always have anywhere from you know, depending on the class, it could be 50, 65, 100 patients, just depending on how uh, how many doctors are attending and, and the patient flow for the day. Um, but AmplifyDental.com is where you can learn about those different uh, classes. And I'll put the slide back up. Um, like I said, if you have any questions, uh, email us, call us. Um, we're very, very knowledgeable about all the products that we have, um, including all the woodpecker products as far as programming the motors or uh, any questions relating to the bone graft materials, um, anybody in our office can be able to help you out with any questions. So I'll turn it back over to Lauren to, to go over the questions that were submitted, and I appreciate everybody's time this evening. Thank you, Kurt. Uh, Tim, are you ready? I am always ready for you, Lauren. Great. Well, so oh, just a little bit of housekeeping uh, for those of you who uh, came on a little bit late. The entire webinar is recorded. That recording will typically go out, I think I'm Golden Dent puts it on the YouTube channel and then they'll send out the link, but usually within a day or two, you'll get a copy of the recording. So in case you came a little bit late or you know weren't able to watch the whole thing, uh, that will go out within the next couple of days. They also handle the CE forms. Uh, that usually takes a little bit longer, about a week or so. I send them the list of everyone that was on. You have to have been here for most of the webinar. We occasionally get people who will come up and say, hey, I didn't get my CE, and I go and check, and they didn't show up until 45 minutes late. So you know, they're not allowed to give CE under those circumstances. So um, if you've been here for the bulk of it, you will get the CE form. There's nothing that you have to do yourself. There's no registration or quiz or anything like that. I would also mention we had an issue this evening where a lot of people were having trouble logging in, saying that their registration had been canceled. Uh, I had about 25, 30 people that emailed me, and if you were one of those people, I apologize. I've not seen that issue ever before I'm going to get with go to webinar afterwards uh, but we still had you know hundreds and hundreds of people that were here this evening but for some reason there was some glitch in the system where a few people had to, to go through a few hoops to get here so I apologize in advance for that okay um, so here we go a lot of these questions are kind of somewhat longer uh, one, the first one is from a dentist in Vermont who is a friend of mine who uh, was also a referring office so um, when you say 221 do you actually not complete the knot at the first pass, or do you just keep going? In my clumsy hands, the suture seems to loosen before I can start the second two, and I feel that I need to complete the first tightening before my number two suture. Is it the suture material, or do I just need to get three or four dozen or so oranges to try to improve my uh, technique? He's in Vermont, so I mean, oranges are really expensive this time of year, so hopefully not. <laughs> Very funny. No, I, 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 I knot it all the way down and then and then uh, double, you know, go through it twice. And then that second pass through, when you go down, it'll push the first knot down even further. Um, and, and I think that will work very well for you. Sometimes, you know, with gut or chromic gut, um, I, I have, have had more problems. And that's why, you know, we as dentists, we have our our our, our most familiar materials. And, and I really like the polyglycolic acid. 
um, the PGA material. It it's, works very well in my hands and it's very consistent. So two all the way down, the second two helps push that first one down even further. And then the third in reverse um, will we'll tie that knot so it doesn't come loose. It's technique, I think. Okay. Uh, let's see. Uh, can you use a collar plug instead of a membrane over allograft? Great question. And the answer to that is no. Okay. And, and I said it a few times, and that's a, that's a comment I, I, I get a lot. A collagen plug, um, collagen material, depending on how it's made, will last anywhere from a couple days, a couple hours to a couple days to maybe maybe up to two weeks. And I said a couple times that allograft human bone must be protected from invagination of epithelium with a passively placed membrane. That membrane has to extend at least two millimeters beyond any defect on all borders. If if and it must be maintained for at least six weeks. If if it comes out before doctors, then the case becomes unpredictable. So I would not use a collagen plug uh, as a membrane. What's what the collagen plug is useful, um, Lauren, for um, hemostasis in some respect, and also to protect a site. For instance, for a smoker, right? If epithelium grows a half a millimeter to a millimeter a day, and you get complete closure in in a week, uh, and the collagen material is intended to last for three weeks then you have protected that that site from from heat tar nicotine etc but uh collagen is not a graft material and it is not an adequate membrane great question okay though. um okay so whenever i use only osteogen plug for socket preservation patients complain about severe pain post-operative for at least three or four days whereas with allograft and membrane they only have mild to moderate Plant pain. Any reason why that may be the case? Yeah, you know that that's not my experience. Um, you know, again, um, I I don't know for sure. It may be technique. The 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 plug should be placed firmly. You can't overpack. Placed firmly uh, to the crest or slightly above the crest. Again, uh, trying to to not incise into mucosal tissue which releases prostaglandin and histamine release. And, and the, those patients hurt. If you incise the mucosa, the patients are going to hurt. If you don't, it's, it, the, the discomfort is handled with 600 milligrams of ibuprofen. So, you know, with your allograft, you probably aren't condensing as, as hard because you're, you're trained not to, to crush it. Uh, and you may, may have a tendency to, to condense the osteogen plug uh, too much. Um, um, I don't I don't have a good answer for that because that's not really my experience. Okay. What about in those rare cases where you actually get bone that covers over the the implant or the healing cap? How do you remove that bone? Uh, I, yeah, I would I would just take a round burr and, and very carefully control it. We, you know, we 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 create chamfers at 200 rpms, um, and certainly you can remove a little bit of bone with a with a, a round burr. Okay. Um, do you know at at Mercy is are you guys teaching this these techniques to the pre doc students or is it just for the post grad? Just post grad, yeah. These are these are the doctors that are coming in, um, and that um, you know uh, Kurt with Golden Den is providing. They're not dental school patients, uh, providing uh, really a great service to to our community uh, patients that are that are needed uh, 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 that that are that are. Um, um, providing some treatment that's really needed in the community. Okay. You showed a bunch of cases where you were, you know, going through, you were, you, where you kind of threaded through on the, onto the palatal, but you weren't actually engaging the palatal tissue. Why not? Why, why wouldn't you want to engage that tissue? It's, it's, it's a periodontal. So what I'm taking is I'm taking the attached gingiva that was on the crestal aspect or crestal lingual, crestal palatal, and I'm actually peeling it and laying it onto that healing abutment so that I get that band of attached gingiva on the facial aspect of the implant. So if I engage the lingual tissue, then I would be pulling that, that uh, non-attached gingiva back onto uh, the facial aspect of the site, if that makes sense. Yep. The, um, 
that book that you uh, showed about uh, suture techniques. Uh, can you remind people where they can get that book? Uh, Salvin Dental, S A L V I N Dental. Probably salvin.com, I would assume. Okay. Um, for people that are typically removing their membranes after four weeks, you mentioned before that you know you're waiting six weeks. Is that your recommendation that six weeks really should be the minimum? Um, yeah, I, I don't I, I don't use a a a, a non-resorbable membrane. I don't feel it's necessary. Most of our membranes, especially those that are provided by Golden Dent, are such high quality. You know, they're intended to they're they're resorbable, but they're intended to last three, four, five months. Um, so there's there's no reason for me to use a non-resorbable membrane that I would want to remove. But the literature is pretty clear that we must protect that epithelium, uh, that um, allograft from invagination of epithelium for about six weeks. Okay. Here's kind of a longer question as well. The case of the immediate implant in, in number of four that you showed, did you create osteotomy and then place osteogen plug before placing the implant? Doesn't the plug fill the osteotomy, causing you to lose your angulation? And if not, the plug is more dense than gel foam. Is the implant penetrating the plug and causing displacement of the plug into the wider socket? <laughs> Great question. The answer is yes. <laughs> that was awesome. <laughs> yeah, I do my osteotomy, then I put place the plug, and the material is very specific. It's different than allograft. If you did that with allograft, you probably wouldn't be able to place the implant completely because of the different shapes uh, uh, and size of the allograft particulate, and, and it binds the threads. The, uh, the osteogen doesn't do that, and you, you're threading into your osteotomy, and the, the osteogen is actually being pushed to fill that the rest of that socket a la like a caulking. Okay. Uh, so we just want to get to all these questions if we can. For socket preservation, after plugging, say, with allograft, do you even need a membrane? Is it, uh, are there situations where you wouldn't? Yeah, with allograft, I always protect it uh, from invagination of epithelium. Otherwise, it, it will become unpredictable. And I know, uh, including myself, uh, everybody out there has knows they're taking a tooth out, know they have to graft, and they come back later, and it's, it's not bone. And, and it be, it's because uh, our epithelial tissue had invaded it. Uh, and and disrupted the the proper bone formation. Okay, what if if someone's placing osteogen plugs and they're seeing a significant amount of washout after a few days? Is is it you know is it due to suturing technique or is there something else that would typically cause that that yeah, you know I, that, that I, graft to come out? Lauren, I think you need to you need to protect it with sutures. Um, you know, um, you're you're telling the patient to be careful. No heavy spitting. No straws. They can rinse with saline if they want. Uh, stay away from crunchy foods like nacho chips, potato chips. Again, the material has to be specifically placed. It has to be placed firmly uh, to or at the crest. It, it can't be flow, flow bloody and, and just kind of laying there. Uh, I, I mean, there is some technique involved, uh, but, but and, and again, uh, we have a tendency to be rather frugal and it, it, the socket may be bigger than the plug that you're using. If you need to use more material, you need to use more material. It has to be a okay. complete fill. Yep. Do you still charge for bone graft and membrane when you're using osteogen? Um, it, the, the, the fee is a little bit different because we're not charging for a membrane. Those are two separate procedures. Okay. Um, do you typically suture over collar plug with PGA to prevent epithelial integration? Um, I, I don't use collar plug other than for a hemostasis or, um, you know, I, I may use it to if their patient's a smoker. Um, but, but I'm, I'm, you know, the collagen plug is is not a graft and it's not a membrane. Right. Is the membrane placed between gingiva and bone, or can you place the membrane inside the socket prior to placing allograft? You can do both. Yeah, as long as it's a resorbable membrane. Right, of course. Uh, rather than laying flaps to, to place implants, why not just use like a surgical guide and, and do like a flapless implant surgery? You know, that's that's really interesting. You said that um, most of the most of the companies today, when, when we started doing um, guided surgery, uh, we thought, oh boy, this is easy. We just lay it on top, and there's a lot of inaccuracies with that technique. 
most reputable companies now, our guides are bone level. They're not tissue level, which means that we do have to reflect the area so that the, the, uh, the uh, guide sits on hard tissue, not on soft tissue. Ah, uh, let's see, I want to make sure we get to all of these. Um, can we place allograft in, on top and can we close it? And I'm trying to read the, the question here, it's a little scattered here. Can we place allograft and top, can we close it, oxygen plug instead of a membrane? Yes, yes. Okay. Can you just briefly go over, um, to remind people of the technique um, that was used to build up the buccal tissue uh, on that implant case? Yeah, so if, if we have the, the facial aspect uh, of a site, um, when, when, when teeth are removed, bone shrinks up and in or down and in. And in so doing, the mucogingival line will migrate towards the crest, which eliminates the band of attached gingiva exactly where you need it. But there is attached gingiva on the crest itself or on the lingual or, or palatal aspect of that crest that we can use. We only need a minimum of two, two millimeters. So I will make my incision slightly lingual or palatal to the crest. I will peel it like an orange and reflect that attached gingiva to the facial aspect, leaving the lingual or palatal tissue intact. I don't reflect it. And then when I place my implants in my healing abutment, or if it's a tooth, I will lay that band of attached gingiva on the healing abutment rather than um, rather than suturing back to its its original position. Therefore, the the body will heal with a band of attached gingiva on the facial aspect of my site. Got it. Well, we are towards the bottom of the hour and we're towards the end of the question so uh tim i'll let you uh say some parting words and i'll uh, close it up after that well i hope you know we, we try lauren i really appreciate you and, and your efforts and, and giving up your time and i hope everybody's well and healthy and and uh and and happy uh it, it's getting winter here in in michigan um but I, I hope the information w was helpful. I know we had a huge audience, which always surprises me a little bit. Uh, and I'm happy to share some of the information. And, and, and as you mentioned, um, ma many of these procedures are on, on YouTube, either through Golden Dent or if you just type in my name. Um, you know, we're trying to share this information to make our doctors more proficient and efficient uh, and more financially rewarding, uh, rewarded. Um, you know, I'm a big believer in general dentistry. I'm a big believer in general dentists becoming uh, super GPs and uh, having the opportunity with you to, to share a little bit of my knowledge is, is uh, very rewarding to me. I thank you. Well, uh, right back at you. You know, we thank you. We know that your time is, is valuable. I, I've done many of these webinars uh, with you over the years. One of the reasons that I really enjoy having Dr. Kaczynski do the webinars, and, and especially for those of you who are repeat uh, viewers of these webinars, is that you know you're not getting the same stuff regurgitated over and over and over again. It's all new cases, it's new techniques, it's new products, it's new systems. Uh, you're always going to be on the quote-unquote cutting edge, uh, which, which is a good thing. So we thank uh, Tim, uh, because I know his time is, is very valuable. As I had mentioned as well, uh, we thank Golden Dent for their sponsorship of these webinars. Uh, you know, it takes a lot. Any of you that ever put on a webinar, you know, it, it doesn't just happen. You've got to get a great speaker and get, get uh, great content and get the invitations out and, you know, handle the recording and handle the CE. I, I just could not do it without Golden Dent. Speaking of the recording and the CE, uh, as a final reminder, the uh, webinar was recorded. Golden Dent will typically send out a link to that recording within a couple of days. The CE takes a little bit longer, usually a week or so. Keep an eye on your junk folders as well. For some reason, I, I never understood why, but some of those end up in, in spam and junk folders. But usually within a week or so, they, they get those out. You had to have been here for the bulk of the webinar. You know, if you, if you came on 40 minutes late, there's just no way that they're allowed to provide a CE under those circumstances. 
Uh, and also as, as a final you know, apology, as I said, I know that a few of you had trouble logging on with some weird error message about registration was canceled. It looks like a number of you were able to get around that. Uh, I have no idea why that happened. I'm going to get to the bottom of it because I've never seen that in the 10 plus years I've been working with GoToWebinar. Uh, thank you to all of you because I know your time is valuable and we hope you continue to join us for these webinars. I know that you, you get good things out of them, so that's, that's great. I think I only have one more webinar uh, left this year. That's with uh, All Star Dental Academy. That's uh, tomorrow, and then we're gonna, you know, wait until 2023 uh, for the next round of webinars. All of you who are here this evening are on my list, and and will be sent invitations for future webinars. Please stay healthy and safe out there. Have a happy holidays. We look forward to seeing all of you in the new year and on our next webinar. Good night, everyone. Good night.